Good evening and welcome. I'm Zita Strickland and I am your host for tonight's Virtual Science in the City. Thank you so much for joining and we appreciate you taking the time to connect with us this evening for this virtual event. Now, while this is a virtual event, it's still interactive and we'll be using the chat box on YouTube throughout this evening. You can send us any questions you have for our speaker during the presentation and I'll be asking your questions of our special guest speaker tonight. But we'd also like to hear from you now. So drop us a line in that chat box saying where you're watching from and how many people you're watching with. It's great to be able to have you join us today. Now, before we start tonight's talk, I have a little bit of other information I'd like to share with you. We've uploaded some of our past Science in the City talks, including events called Mars Surface Exploration, Past, Present, and Future, In the Studio, The Science Behind Radio, and Pizza, Robots, and Restaurants of the Future. These talks and many others can be found in the Science in the City playlist on PacSci's YouTube page. Educational programming like this tonight is made possible in part thanks to the generous support of our donors. In the face of challenges like COVID-19 and climate change, science and an informed public are absolutely essential. If you're able to, we suggest a $10 donations for tonight's event to help us ensure that curiosity never closes. For more information about donating to PACSI, you can visit PACSI.org support. Now about tonight's talk all about games. You've played games before, but have you ever created one? Have you ever thought about what elements need to be considered when creating a new board game for both national and global markets? Well, during tonight's event, we're gonna walk through the process of game development step-by-step step to demystify many of the aspects that go into creating games. And we're joined tonight by an experienced game designer with Robinsberger. Now, Robinsberger is a local company founded in 1883. It's a leading producer of puzzles and award-winning board games, as well as engaging art and science kits. Robinsberger is family-owned, and their toys engage the heart, the hands, the mind, and they encourage play for all ages. Pacific Science Center began partnering with Robinsberger in early 2019, and on a visit to the Science Center, you may have seen some of their contributions, including the Gravitrax Marble Run, a life-size make and break game board, or their Brio play space during Railroad Weekend. Through all of these, Robinsberger has put the fun into fundamental science concepts, and we've been delighted to work with them. So tonight, joining us to talk with us about game development, we're joined by Mike Mulvihill, a game designer and developer for Robinsberger North America. Mike is a grizzled veteran of gaming and who has over 30 years of experience delivering successful games of many types, including board games, role-playing, card, miniature, social, and electronic games. Mike has made a career out of creating universes and has an extensive background, including narrative creation, mechanics development, and AI concepting. You have probably played a game that Mike has helped bring to life. His experience includes efforts with Disney, Marvel, DC Comics, Star Wars, Major League Baseball, NASCAR, Halo, Universal Pictures, Warner Brothers, and the Wizarding World of Harry Potter. Mike's originally from Chicago, but now resides in Seattle with his wife, his two daughters, and a snake named Sir Hiss. Mike, hello and welcome. We're glad to have you here with us tonight. Hi, it's uh, kind of weird when you hear your life <laughs> narrated by somebody else. So um, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. And and uh, thank you. Uh, we love the partnership that we have with the Pacific Science Center. I was there for helping to set up for the Brio event and just to see the, the connection between play and science and learning and more play um, just as wonderful uh, ability to cross what people don't think are um, crossable stream. So thank you for the opportunity and thank you for this evening. So let me go ahead and share my screen. I think that is working, hopefully. Is that working? I think so. Uh, as I was told, my name is Mike Mulvihill. I'm gonna do a little presentation on the art and science of making games. Uh, I am a game developer at Robinsburg, North America. Um, just some background into me. Uh, I've been making games as we just 
learned for approximately 30 years or so. I've worked in, both in comic books and electronic games. I've worked, I actually taught at the UW Bothell for a while. Um, I've worked at EA, which most people know. Um, some of these companies like Harebrain is still in operation on, on the east side and are really good friends of mine. So um, I've been doing that. And here are some of the products that we've talked about uh, or qu real quick that um, are things I've brought to market that hopefully somebody out there has seen or heard of. Um, and with uh, mentioned many of the properties that I've worked on over time, um, some uh, concurrently, actually, uh, as you'll see as we go through the slides. I was even once a uh, Kickstarter award for those who know Kickstarter. Um, I was a $10,000 pledge and I came to your house and played games with you. So uh, that was one of my, it actually sold out, which is a crazy, crazy thing. But uh, I, I've, I've actually you can add that to my resume of things I've done uh, with, with games. So that's me. And let's talk a little bit about Ravensburger. Uh, Ravensburger North America, as was said, is headquartered here in Seattle. Uh, the game division is headquartered here. A lot of people know Ravensburger from our puzzles, uh, which is funny because uh, Ravensburger actually first create, created their first board game in 1884 before they ever made puzzles. Um, they're a German-based company in the town of Ravensburg in South, I think it's Southwestern, um, near the Swiss border. Um, it's a small little hamlet. It's really cute, great town to, to go to. And um, that's our, where our, you know, our headquarters is. And so for a lot of my experience, I knew them before I, when I worked at other game companies. And um, it just a thrilled to be able to work with them in their North American office doing um, other kinds of games that maybe appeal more to a North American audience than a, a European audience. Here's a quick little select, oops, selection of games that we do here. Uh, Disney Villainous is our big North American hit right now. Labyrinth is probably the biggest game Ravensburger has done in its history. I think it's at about 5 million copies now worldwide. Castles of Burgundy is one of those games that if you are a gamer uh, by definition, then uh, you've seen it or heard it. Um, it's usually a perennial top 10 all-time game. Um, and then we do things with Disney, like uh, with um, for a, a kids market under our Word Wonder Forge label, we do things like matching games and and princess games. So we so under all of those games are games that I've touched in some way or worked on, and that's um, a really cool place to be because we are uh, everything from a deep strategy game like Castles of Burgundy to something fun and for a three plus age group like doing matching. Um, now, that was all great and that was all fun, but what are we talking about when we talk about games? Um, usually what ends up happening is somebody, I'll ask, and if we were in a place where we could raise our hands and shout things out, I would say, hey, what are games? And then what ends up ending up happening is we get these games first. These are the ones that everybody talks to. Oh, games I'm playing on my phone or, you know, console or computer games or some old school person like me will go, wait, what about um, Defender and the arcade back in 19 blah, 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 blah. Um, and so you usually get those kinds of games. And then you can kind of, that's kind of like the first tier of games. Then you'll get the other people say, well, wait, what about board games? or miniature games, some card games with uh, we card game market like uh, Pokemon or, um, or Magic the Gathering, um, role-playing games. Uh, a lot of people grew up with those as, as I did. So you'll get those usually second as people say, oh, well, we're separating now. We're making a conscious effort to separate something that's mass consumed, like the first column, to something that's a little bit more specialized, like in the second column. But then, there, then that usually ends the discussion. And here's where really you need to kind of open your mind up to what games are historically and in a bigger picture than what we tend to think as the fun entertainment. <clears throat> there are a lot of games that fall into this last category that we don't even think of when we think of games. Sports, uh, when kids go outside and they are like, oh, we were playing a game, mom, in the backyard. And, it's some kind of crazy thing where they start to explain the rules and they can't even figure it out themselves. Those are all games. They're all games because they are things that, the, that they're doing that, that are entertaining themselves. 
Vegas is an entire city built on gaming, much as Rome was basically for hundreds of years financed through gameplay because they uh, didn't manage themselves very well. Um, but there are games that are out there that we don't think of as games because we don't classify them with the other two categories. And yet they're very much a part of the game culture or even the, the game uh, process. And so, you know, when we look at this, what are the takeaways? What makes all of the things on this page common, um, have a, what, what are their common roots, if you will? Um, well, they all have rules. Whether you can explain them or not, they're there. Um, they have some kind of challenge or some kind of contest or something that allows you to, to, to declare a, a one lost victory. Sometimes it's a conflict between me and you, who's gonna win the race first. And sometimes it's something we do cooperatively, like how do we together as a team uh, figure out how to cross this you know, river in one of those kind of work uh, things that people do to you know, do teamwork. Um, but mostly also they're interactive, meaning that you can play a game by yourself, but you're interacting with something, whether it's your own high score that you want to beat or you're interacting with other players. Uh, people don't realize, you know, we talk about kind of like the game culture, you know, as if it was something that was invented in 2015. When in reality, if you think, if you just go back in time, game culture has always been there. There was bowling and poker nights in the 50s. There was euchre and uh, bridge nights in the you know 1800s so the social interaction of games is not something that's happened you know yesterday or when somebody said oh we're an interactive game so we've just made that up now it's always been the case with games that they have that but there's some other things that they have in common that we don't think about when we just pick up a game and start to play it with our friends we enter games willfully so think about that for a second. If you're forced to play a game, then it's really not a game at that point. It's usually a punishment of some kind and no one wants that. So a game by its pure nature needs to be entered willfully. It's, it's got a closed system, i.e., for lack of a better term, a rule book. You are playing with the game using this set of rules. Sometimes those rules are very vague in a game of tag, for instance, or it's really super formalized in the case of baseball that has like a rule book that reads like a law document. Um, they also create an internal value. There's no, the money in Monopoly doesn't really count towards anything, but in the game, it creates a value. It tells you, hey, in Monopoly, these fake pieces of paper are actually worth something towards a goal. And most importantly of all, and we'll get to this later in the, in the show, is there's player engagement. Player engagement means we don't have games if we don't have players. It, it, without players, whether it's an individual game, an app on your phone or anything, we don't have games. And so this will come out in, in, towards the end of the slides and how we try to min maximize player engagement because that actually maximizes all these other things and, and, and makes what, what I would consider to be a working and fun game. So let's define a game. Let's try to figure out what we're doing when we make a game. Sid Meier came up with this phrase. For those who don't know, Sid Meier is an electronic game uh, guru. He created one of the first and most successful games ever called Civilization. They're now on Civilization VI. It's a world building it runs the gamut from, you know, the year zero to the year 3000. It is a standard game. Uh, his name is uh, hailed as one of the people who figured out how to take electronic and computer games and make them engaging even at a solo level. He wrote, games are a series of interesting choices. And you go, hey, well, yeah, I guess so. If I'm playing a game, I'm making some good choices. The problem with that statement and why it ended up leading people down to, if uh, those who are familiar have ever heard of the phrase gamification, that is how do I take regular things and turn them into games so that you will do them, like spend more at Starbucks or buy more groceries or whatever it is, is because interesting choices is uh, kind of vague. It may be to you on Thursday, an interesting choice when you go to McDonald's and have to decide between a burger and a chicken sandwich. You go, wow, that's an interesting choice. 
That's not a game though. So we, while it's a starting point and he makes some, he makes a really good distinction between what a player is expecting and what a designer needs to achieve. It's really, really kind of not, doesn't hit the nail on the head exactly right. In a great book by uh, Katie Salen and Eric Zimmerman, they came up with this quote after uh, uh, doing a bunch of research and that is, a game is a system in which players engage in an artificial conflict defined by rules that results in a quantifiable outcome. So if you go back to a couple slides before, that's exactly what we said. And you're like, wow, that is a game. Yeah, I can understand that because it's an artificial conflict. Uh, it's defined by rules. There's, there's an outcome. Somebody wins, somebody loses. Um, it makes perfect sense. Um, and it does. And it's a great definite, basically kind of big box definition of what a game is. And um, because the world we live in, people can't leave well enough alone, uh, philosophers got involved. Now, I personally have a degree in philosophy, so I tend to like philosophers a lot, but sometimes philosophers say things you don't want to hear. So for instance, in the Grasshopper Games and Utopia, Bernard Suits comes up with this definition of games. He calls it the Luziori attitude. And it's to play a game is to engage in activity directed towards bringing about a specific state of affairs using the only the means per per permitted by the rules where the rules actually prohibit more efficient means, uh, excuse me, more efficient favor of less efficient means where such rules are accepted just because they make possible such of activity. In other words, playing a game is the voluntary attempt to overcome unnecessary obstacles. Wow. Um, when I first read that, I was got, I got angry. And then the more I thought about it, I'm like, no, you know, that's pretty true. <laughs> um, you know, if you're if you're playing a game, um, let's say you're playing. Uh, well, I'll show you some games later on. But if, if you're just playing a playing Mario and you need to give save the princess, it's not that Mario runs across the screen and saves the princess. He's got to jump over obstacles. He's got to dodge sliding. Uh, uh, turtles. He's, he has to uh, dive down in the sewers and go through a whole maze of things. It's not straightforward. It's like they made stuff up just to drive you nuts. And technically, that's what we do when we make a game, is we give you parameters, we give you a set of rules, we tell you, here's the solution, or here's what you're trying to do to win, or just survive, and uh, we're going to stack things against you. It, you know, uh, I always use the example of the infield fly rule in baseball. Where did that come from? Why is it necessary? Why is there a rule that says if a ball is hit into the infield, well, it's because somebody took the rules, tried to do something else, and, and then in, in, and instead they said, wait, that, that wasn't very fair. You know, well, we got to make a rule up to stop that thing from happening, even though that was a simple solution based on all the other rules. So, yeah, he's kind of right. The problem with all three of those parameters, if you will, or de definitions, is the word fun doesn't appear in any of them. And as we stated earlier, games are voluntary. You don't play a game if you don't think you're going to have fun doing it. So we, have, we now have a kind of a definition for a game, and we kind of know that it needs to be fun. So what, how do we build one? How do we make one? And I like to go, as I said, my philosophical background comes pouring out because I like to use as an example, Aristotle there and his poetics, or because we're in a science-based uh, discussion, the periodic table. Everything has building blocks. Sometimes we don't acknowledge them or sometimes we ignore them or sometimes we don't even think about it. And I can't tell you how many times I've had a glass of water and never went, wow, that hydrogen and that oxygen really combine real well for me. And the same thing when I see a play or a movie, I don't go, wow, really, I, the diction in that was fantastic. But every once in a while, when it actually appears in matters, you notice it. And so what I'm hoping today is to basically show you what those blocks are to get to that fun factor and, and, and make the games follow the model that we've outlined as, as what a game is. So uh, this is based on some information from Jesse Shell's fantastic The Art of Game Design. Um, a, if you are ever interested in reading it, it is, a, it is basically a, a primer. And he comes up with four. 
and he's absolutely right. These are basically the four building blocks of a game. Uh, technology, aesthetics, story, and mechanics. And how are these applied and how do we use those? Well, technology doesn't mean like space age technology, you're always pushing the envelope. It's really the delivery system of a game. How is the game being delivered to the fan? It could be, as in the one picture in the, in the right-hand corner, a card game. Cards are the delivery system for that game. That technology is not new. It's really, really old. And yet it still works because it delivers gameplay to people. Uh, more, you know, you have VR, which is pushing the boundaries the other way, saying here's an entirely new game experience that we're using to try to make this a, uh, a viable new option. And then, of course, uh, there's, a, a, you know, our villainous game here down here in the bottom uh, it uses cards and a small player board, moving pieces. Uh, again, each piece, uh, its own little, you know, um, component to make a greater story. Of course, my all-time favorite and the thing that I love most of all is the pop matic uh, I think that that uh, doesn't matter what whatever we do in VR or app-based game design, no one's beaten the pop matic in my opinion. It's the greatest thing ever. And then like something like even like Operation, which use batteries and electronics and buzzer sounds, all of those things are how the game is delivered to a player. Sometimes, oh, uh, one thing I guess I should say going back one slide is these aren't equal. These are dependent on the product you're trying to make. So while I, th I'm talking about a card game, the technology is really, really low. It's already been established. You know exactly what people are getting. So technology is not where, you know, it's not pushing the cutting edge. It is there, though. So you look at it and say, how am I being delivered this game? So uh, example that I use um, from one that I worked on at Ravensburger is a game called No. We know that trivia games are popular. What we wanted to do was make a trivia game that was never ending. So that a card, a question could be asked today if I'm living in Seattle, Washington and card, the same card could be asked of you if you're living in LA or in Japan or in Germany and the answer, because you're using the Google electronic device, the Google Assistant, would tell you the information where you're at. So if I said, hey, if we said, what is the temperature right now? I would say, oh, I don't know, 82 degrees. And there, it, But somebody in Germany might say 54. And it's night in Japan, so it might be, you know, 32. And because we could leave it vague like that, it could be Celsius or Fahrenheit. It could be, we could say, what is the temperature at the, at the top of Mount Everest? Because that's actually a data point that Google tracks. So with using the device, the electronic Google Assistant, we're able to create a, um, a trivia game that could never end. You, you could buy new cards for it. You don't have to buy new cards for it because every time you play it and where you play it and when you play it, um, it continues to operate. So our delivery system for this was very different than doing a regular trivia game. We needed to have electronic components. We needed to have uh, work with Google on a whole backend structure. So the technology for this was actually really an apparent and in your face, even though technically it was actually under the hood because you don't have to know all that stuff. You just have to, we just had to make it. So that, that's how technology plays a part in any game that you pick up and use. The next one's going to be pretty obvious to everybody when my slideshow moves. There it is. Yay. And that's aesthetics. And that's, oh, and then it jumps a bunch of things ahead as slideshows will want to do. Um, uh, come on, one more, one more. There we go. It's the look and feel of a game. This is a, a, a picture set of a bunch of um, our games at Ravensburger. Um, and you can see that in some cases, you know, we're, we're, we're putting our effort into really cool, uh, um, uh, fi figures that you move on the board. In some cases, it's the cover art. In some, it's the entire process, like the Marvel game. Well, down here, we have a game from Back to the Future. So we needed to use the aesthetics of Back to the Future or from wrestling. What we're doing here is selling you the game. This is the game, the look and, the look and feel of a game. When somebody goes, oh, that game was gorgeous. And it, we, you, we know that it works. You, they, the crazy thing to combine, and you would think that aesthetics and 
technology would be opposites that, oh, if I'm going to spend time on technology, I'm going to lose the aesthetics. When, when we are living right now at a period where both Microsoft and, and Sony are going to be releasing technological updates to their newest consoles, and they sell it to people by showing, wow, look at the really cool new graphics. So in reality, they're actually the same, you know, both sides of the same coin. Um, Ironically, this is not the correct slide, but I'll talk about it anyway. This is our game Labyrinth. Um, the cool thing on the aesthetics about this game was we needed to come up with a game and imagery and iconography that is universal. This game is sold in like 30 countries, every European language that you can think of, all the uh, South American languages, North American languages. So we needed to have graphics and icon icons that were that transcended um, a region or a group. And so, you know, going back and using fantasy tropes and, and doing them in a kind of a cartoony way gave us the aesthetic of this is an evergreen game that never goes away. And so far for uh, 25, 35 years, Labyrinth has been uh, a perennial favorite game uh, selling, you know, millions and millions of copies worldwide. Then we talk about story. Um, I have three games here that we've done at Ravensburger. And as you could tell, when we talk about the story, we're talking technically somebody else's story. We are trying to capture within our game the feeling of playing back to the feeling of the back to the future storyline, the playing in the world in the Jaws storyline, playing in the Jurassic Park storyline. So we have to do our due diligence on our end to create a story that you're going to recognize as being a part of that, that movie or film or franchise, and then set your, your mind into that story and become part of it. The better we do that, the better success we've discovered in games. Now, there are other kinds of stories. These are board game stories, but you're talking things like, um, you know, the, the Pokemon storyline of that got to catch them all, or you have, you know, which is a very simple storyline, but has been able to maintain a long, gen long generation of games. You have things like Dungeons and Dragons, the ultimate story, fantasy world, worlds upon worlds, uh, characters upon characters, novels written, um, stories, a selling point and stories, a selling point. If you were playing a video game, they, you know, we're going to really, you know, hype the d depth of this story and, and, and make you care about the character you're playing, even though in your back of your head the entire time you're going pixels, those are just pixels, but yet somehow the story ropes you in and keeps you playing. Uh, for an example of that, I'm going to use the game that just came out last week, a um, game I worked on called Marvel Villainous. And in this game, you are playing one of the villains of the Marvel Universe trying to achieve your goals while the other villains are trying to achieve those, their goals, totally separate goals. So each villain needs to have his own story within that. And then you need to have who stops those villains. Well, in this case, it's all the Marvel heroes. They fight everybody. Although, um, and so you run into a situation where you're fighting villains and other villains as well as other heroes, all in the trying to get yourself to a victory point, which like I said, is unique to you, your victory uh, Thanos there in the bottom right is totally different victory conditions than Hela on the bottom left. And so your one eye is making sure your villains don't get too far ahead of you. The other is making sure the heroes are not fighting you, but fighting them. And the goal there is to immerse the player into the storylines that they're familiar with within a Marvel universe. So uh, that's, uh, that's our, that, you know, so story is, is equally important. Mechanics. Now, um, we could talk about mechanics. Uh, basically, we could go to, you know, start now and go to bed Friday and still not have a complete discussion of mechanics. So I'm only going to kind of talk to you about what a mechanic is just in general and not specifically talk about mechanics and then follow it up with what we do when we look at mechanics. Mechanics are not simply the rules, but the entire way we want the player to interact with the game. As we said earlier, when we were talking about what defines a game, every game has its set of rules. Taking the rules of Monopoly and then trying to take it over and play Clue, you're, there's no point, it doesn't work. And it doesn't work because the rules are contained to that product. 
So when we're making a game and trying to make something, whether it's with dice or with cards or with anything else, we are trying to make a game that the mechanics make sense and are simple and understandable and appropriate for the product that we're trying to make. Um, I call it the, the I use BFC as my, my little code to discuss how games work. Game rules are balanced, meaning that we don't make it so that, uh, you know, the player playing the shoe in Monopoly is going to win every time because the shoe gets some extra power. That's not a balanced game. So we don't do that. <laughs> and maybe we do in a game that calls for the shoe to be really unbalanced. And then that we usually then give something else to all the other characters. But we try to balance a game, meaning everybody has a fair chance of winning. But that's different than when a player complains, my game isn't fair. That's almost exclusively the number one game complaint you hear as a rules make, as a game maker about your rules. It's unfair. Why is it unfair? Well, somebody X thinks they have a better advantage playing a certain character than I do playing this other character. Now, sometimes that's actually skill level. You'll hear little kids say this game's not fair when they play against an adult and they're playing a quote unquote adult level game. They'll say, this isn't fair. What they're really saying is, you know more, you have more knowledge coming into this game than I do. We have to constantly make sure that those rules, if we are saying, for instance, this game is playable by ages six to 99, a six year old can't go, well, I can never win against my dad. That's not fair at all. So we have to make sure when we make those games, you know, why something like Uno has been successful for so many years is because it's fair. You may not, somebody may, you know, be smarter at it and maybe win a tad bit more than somebody else. But the bottom line is it's a fair game. It's just, you know, your strategy and what you bring to the table. And it, it, it mitigates that. Um, so uh, that's what fair is. The, uh, the, just in case you're curious, the uh, chart there is from the game Risk. Um, because it was, it's the best math to show basically fairness of numbers. And then the last thing is, and my wife had to look this up because she didn't think it was a real word, word, is comprehensible. Meaning you have to comprehend the rules. They're not fair if you don't understand them. And they're not balanced if, you, if, if rules are, don't make sense. So from our standpoint, when we're working with someone and we're trying to create rules, the first thing we do is we play the game, you know, play the prototype, play the, the thing on, a, on, on the bo on a paper using handwritten cards and things like that, just to see if we have a balanced game in which everybody can possibly win. Now we start to break it down and say, why was X winning? So going back a couple of slides to Disney villain or Marvel villain is here. I have to make sure when we're making this game that Hela has an equal chance of winning as Thanos, as Killmonger. I have to make sure that their combinations win. Now, Killmonger may win 52% of the time, but that's still within fair because somebody else can, that means 48% of the time they're not winning and somebody else is. So the goal is to make sure that you're, you're doing that in a way in which the rules all make sense. Now, I'm going to go back a few slides here because I realized I uploaded the wrong <laughs> thing. Uh, which I apologize, but uh, the going back to Labyrinth, which should have been the next slide was, is, oops, is this game, oh, sorry. Sorry, I don't know why it's continually to go backwards when I'm hitting the forward button. And one more, yay, ah. Oh. Oh, there we go. Um, one of the things about mechanics that, that, that has to be brought up is mechanics aren't always dice. And they're all, not always some secret mathematical uh, digits being run in the back of a computer game to see whether or not you did enough damage to something. Um, mechanics can be what you bring to the table that are different and unique and done in a different way. Labyrinth, for instance, as I said, is a universal game. The, there's no writing on the board. There's no memorizing pieces. The goal of Labyrinth is to get all the little prizes that you have in your hand. And you do that by taking a tile, as you can see it over in the far left-hand corner there. Um, I don't know if I can point at this tile right here. 
taking that and then pushing it in one of these yellow arrows, therefore changing the entire flow of the board. That's a game mechanic. There's no cards, there's no dice, it's totally choice of the player. It changes the board every turn. We don't need to do a lot of language manipulation. We just have to write a very clear one to two page set of rules on how that interacts. And now every that can be translated in all the languages and we don't change anything in the box. That's the comprehensible part of, 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 of rules. When they are so simple and so elegant, they, are, they become universal, almost a universal language. So let's go here, all the way back here. Once we have all that and we say, here are all the elements to the game, there are some two elements that um, Jesse Shell did not talk about that I feel are actually probably more important than any others. Um, the old story is uh, with, with, that, with the model of the four cubes, the technology, aesthetics, story, and mechanics, is that um, that's like having like a fully equipped workshop. All the tools, all the supplies, all the wood that you need to make anything. And you go in and you make something. The problem is, is when you bring that thing out the door, you're not sure anybody actually ever really wanted that thing. And that's where I think it's really important that the fifth and sixth blocks are talked about. And, 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 and it, from my perspective, uh, dictate actually what happens in the four smaller blocks. The first is the publisher. So in this case, that would be me at Ravensburger. Um, we make a decision. We say we wanna make a Marvel villainous game or a uh, Back to the Future game. At that point, then we talk about what is the story going to be? Are we going to do all the movies, one of the movies? How will we work that? We're working on that on our end with the licensor who actually has a huge say in it, as well as, you know, uh, our, our team is already trying to look at look and feel of the box and the componentry. And we already know we're making a board game. So what we need to know is, is there plastic in it? Is how much cardboard is in it? Are we doing cards? Are we doing something special to any of the pieces? So all of this is going on while an inventor, myself or someone outside the company, is working on the mechanics. Now, in a lot of cases, um, you know, they, they can have say in the story. They may say, oh, I got an idea to make it a th all three movies. And we're like, oh, let's steer it. That'd be great. We're thinking about that. They may say, I want, you know, 600 miniatures. We're going to say, of course, no, we can't afford that. But that would be where they would maybe have some say in the technology of stuff. They have less say maybe in the aesthetics, but you know, uh, they do say, you know, we want this to be this character. So while, so <laughs> we, can, we can do a whole nother session someday on my role in all that, which is being like the little arrow between all of these boxes and, and the publisher, but that's our call. So we're actually kind of dictating what that product is gonna be. When you go into the workshop, we're saying we want a chair. So don't come out with a bench, don't come out with a bedroom, uh, a bed, don't come out with a cowbird. We need a chair and we're gonna ask you to help make that chair. The, the, the last box is interesting because it's actually probably the, should be like in the center because what we're doing, have the other part of our company is looking at what the consumer's looking at and wanting. The consumer dictates technology, aesthetics, story, and in some cases, even mechanics, because some mechanics, for instance, a giant uh, World War II simulation game that uses little tiny paper uh, cardboard, which we used to call chips in the day, it is not something that's going to sell very well in Target. Something that takes four hours to play is not going to sell very well in Target or Walmart or on Amazon. We need games that fit that market because that's what Ravensburger does. So that's my job to understand who the consumer we're making this product is. The, my boss to agree with me or to tell me, no, we want to go in this other direction. And then the team, uh, each one of these being its own set of people, production and our design team, and then our, um, uh, you know, me and, and with the mechanics, the person making the mechanics, is we have to make sure we're going to make a product the consumer wants. Making a game, again, going all the way back to our beginning in which nobody wants to play, we've kind of missed all of our bullet points, all, all of the, um, the bullet points of making a game if we make something that no one actually wants to play. It could be great. And I've played great, great, great games that we would never publish in a, 
just because of their the nature of the game or the difficulty level of the game. But it doesn't mean it's not a good game, and it doesn't mean it won't find its consumer. It's just that sometimes it's really, really hard to to align all those things up and get what you want at the very end, which is a game. Uh, nowadays, because of uh, Kickstarter and things like that, the inventor um, of a game, he may be in charge of all of this himself. There, he may also be his own publisher. So in reality, he's kind of like this big giant cube himself. And that's what Kickstarter is allowed <clears throat> because people were realizing I, I am a certain kind of game consumer and I don't see those games being made by the publisher, whoever that is. It may be Ravensburger, it may be anybody else. So I'm gonna make my game that does it a little differently. Some of them are huge successes and wildly creative games. Some of them are not, but it's the fact that they, they've kind of removed a lot of these blocks and basically made like one block called me and then the other block called Kickstarter. So, um, I just want to make sure that you understand that it's not a, hey, we make a game and then we put it out. We're actually, there's tons of research that's going on in, in, in parallel and in concept with the publisher and the consumer. And then each one of these little blocks is also, in, in theory, affected by what the consumer says and does. So what does that net us? We now have a product. We now followed some guidelines to get a product. And so what's the goal in making this game? What we try to do now is, this is where the consumer comes in. We've listened to what they said. We've looked at the mod, we looked at what is interesting from everything from an IP standpoint to other games that are out there. And what we told the player is what this game is gonna be. We, we, find, we wanna know, did it deliver that? What was their expectation? What was the consumer's expectation of a game in Target? You know, it may not be something really huge, and it may, but it may surprise us. Uh, for years and years and years, the, you couldn't get the games that Ravensburger makes in Europe in Target. And that all changed with uh, Settlers of Catan, maybe, you know, now almost like 20 years ago. Um, that, you know, now all of a sudden that game's in there, most likely many of you have played it. There was a time when that game would never come close to being in a, in a target. It was not considered to be what the consumer would want or expect. So over time, we have to monitor what that is. And then that game, does it deliver to that? That game, you know, people play it because it delivered their expectation. Hey, here's an interesting, cool board game that I've never heard of that does unique, interesting new mechanics. It delivered what it was, what it was asked to do. Then once you've done that, once you've got a game and the, the market team wants it out there and the retailer wants it out there and consumers seem to be interested, the second biggest part is what happens after they open the box. And that is what we call is player engagement. There are a lot of games, uh, my boss has a thing on his, in a, on his wall, um, uh, the head of uh, Rob. on as well he says let's keep games out of the game graveyard and what he means by that is there are good games there are really really good games and we've made some and realized we missed somewhere along the line whether it was when we looked at that box we went too much on the aesthetics and left out some of the mechanics or whether it was something like um you know this game's way too difficult for this crowd we've missed the mark somewhere along the line in one of those four boxes and either of the two larger boxes so what we try to make sure we get is that player engagement. I played this game. I didn't win, but man, there was something cool in here. And I want to be back. I want to try it again. Maybe not today. Maybe not tomorrow. Maybe with my other group of friends. Maybe with just my family. Maybe right now. Let's play again. Player engagement is the key to everything that we do. Because without it, we don't have a product. And without a product, there's, there's as we said earlier, there's no game without the players being voluntarily engaged. And the last one is player agency. Now this is a kind of a deep dive term that we use, uh, electronic games use it a lot, uh, board games use it a little bit less, but it's really the same thing. And that is we wanna make sure that the player feels like when they're playing their game, they're in control of their situation. You'll hear it sometimes, people will say things, my favorite always is, is wow, that game's really random, uh, Yahtzee. 
very random because you roll dice and yes, there's some mathematical formulas underneath the dice, but the bottom line is it's totally random. You could roll, you could roll five sixes three turns in a row, or somebody can never roll a five six, you know, in ten games. It's just random. And there, there's some pushback on that. And there's pushback on it because the, they don't sometimes players don't feel, but Yahtzee goes past it because they're able to do something and say, well, you rolled something you may not like, but where would you like to place it on your sheet? All of a sudden now the player has a little bit of agency. It's not the same level of agency that you would get if you were playing uh, a super deep um, game or an electronic video game or something like that, or one of the AAA titles out there. Or even if you're playing a, uh, you know, a uh, fantasy baseball, it, it, but it, there's, it's there. The player feels in this feed, these, these three things kind of loop together and feed on each other. The more the player, you deliver what the player expected, the more he's willing to be engaged. He's not going to fight you. And the more he's willing to be engaged, the more he's discovering the player agency of his choices. The reason why you want all that is because that gets you player immersion. And when we're all said and done, if you take anything away from anything I said, and that is we want a player to have a large emotional connection to the product. And it's whether it's our game, whether it's another game, whether it's a video game, um, some people do it, you know, through deep story. You know, we consider our games super immersive because we treat story so highly. But, you know, there's a lot of people who go to Vegas and don't care so much about the story, but they're going to play blackjack for six straight hours because they are immersed in that game. They feel there's an emotional connection that they have. It may not be the one that you prefer them to have, but it's there and they have it. And so what we try to do at Ravensburger is get to player immersion. And sometimes that's light for a game in a, or a three plus matching game in which you're just matching just different colored tiles to you know something like one of these games here that we've put out over the years uh, and try to figure out how you get your immersion how do we tell the story in the game and get people buying it get people talking about our games and then starting that cycle again once you've established that cycle people trust you a little bit more the next time. And so our goal as a game company and is what I do as a designer is to say, hey, if my name's on a box, I want them to know that they got everything we can offer. And then if, you know, with, and, and, and then we move on and we, we surprise them, horrify just one storytelling game of the year. Um, it, we, we thought it was a really cool game with a really cool hook, but we did not see the fact that we really kind of hit a bunch of those points Sometimes it's on purpose and sometimes things just happen in your favor. Um, and so we, that um, is how we come about and think about making games at Robinsberger. It's also how I come around and think about making games. And so at this point, I guess I'm more than happy to answer anybody's questions about this. I hope you learned something. And then of course, I'm more than happy to answer questions. Excellent, Mike. I am so thank you so much for joining us. That was a great talk. Um, I'm glad you're happy to answer some questions because we have a lot of them for you. Um, <laughs> not paying attention to the chat, everybody. It's an amazing chat, along with some side conversations with some game recommendations. So I highly encourage you to take a look at that. Um, we will save this video for later, so you'll be able to watch it again. Um, and there's some amazing game recs. Uh, as we said, we are going to move on to the question and answer portion from you now. So if you do have any questions or comments, leave them in the YouTube chat, and I'll let Mike know what they are. Um, also, if you haven't yet, let us know where you're watching from and who you're watching with. Um, we have people from all over Western Washington, um, from Queen Anne and Mercer Island to Everett, Redmond, Puyallup, um, also Los Angeles, Las Vegas, and Kentucky. A lot of people are watching with some family, with friends, um, and with some cats as well. Um, Mike, Sir Hiss, is that from, how, how'd you get that name? <laughs> uh, it's not my cat, uh, my, excuse me, it's not my uh, snake, it's my daughter's snake. She brought back for, with her from college, and Sir Hiss is obviously from the Disney Robin Hood movie, so. That, that was definitely the guess in the chat. Hello? So, when we're, there was a great comment that Ben made when you were talking about some of the blocks 
that are put into gameplay, which I thought was just a great comment, which is, you know, golf would be a lot more efficient if you just picked up the ball and placed it in the hole. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, uh, I apologize people, everybody, I'm, I, that kind of broke up a little bit. I might turn, is it okay if I turn my camera off real quick? Absolutely. Yeah, so All right. I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, we'll, so we'll see if that works and help with the stream a little bit. Um, so golf would be a lot more efficient if you just picked up the ball and placed it in the hole. So having right. those blocks are really important to game design. Um, which I think led us to a conversation about groups competing to or working together towards a goal. Um, yeah, it's cooperative. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. Uh, so cooperative gameplay is a real interesting and, and, and you know, um, uh, mechanical breakdown of how a game works. And it's when it's all said and done, it technically, if you think about it, works the same way as a regular game. In a regular game, it's me versus you or me versus the other players in a cooperative game it's almost us versus something sometimes it's a clock a timer sometimes there's a track on the board for every time you get wrong something happens so when talking about a, so yes that's an actual tool in the tool shed if you will of game design is where do we make a game uh, horrified for instance is a cooperative game and we use that that you know to, because that was an idea of saying well no one wants to Either everybody wants to play the monsters or, you know, no one wants only one to be monster and we don't get to be the monsters. So when you're sitting there coming up with that story for the game, you start to look at all of the options. Well, what would be cooler would be the monsters running rampant and we're trying to, to uh, you know, stop them. Well, that's cool, but we, then we need some sort of other tracker, something in, in Horrified, there's a terror tracker. So every time something happens poorly, the the... Uh, the, the, it gets closer to the monsters winning. And so, yeah, um, uh, the, the big one that a lot of people play now uh, with the unfortunate name of Pandemic um, is, a, is a board game that is kind of made, made a real kind of public push towards um, cooperative games, which allowed us to publish something like Horrified. Again, the change in what the consumer will allow allowed us to put a game like Horrified out because it's a cooperative game. Consumers were more ready to accept a game that involved teamwork than, than involved, um, uh, you know, just us all fighting against each other, if you will. I hope that yeah, answered the question. I missed a part of it with my crazy- No, I, I think that that was great. Um, I wanna to touch a little bit on what consumers are looking for because as Pam commented, we've heard that the puzzle world has definitely took off when COVID hit. Um, so is, are we seeing a, a change in the types of games people are looking for? right now during these these COVID times? Yes, oh, totally. A COVID-themed um, game in the future? <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of stuff has changed. Um, the, it, from our standpoint, I won't speak about other companies, but from our standpoint, what we saw is, and we don't use, we don't make a lot of these games, so it didn't affect us so much, but a lot of uh, uh, what we, we would call the plastic play games. These are the games that are advertised on, you know, various kid channels. Um, uh, you know, um, usually some kind of silly slash toilet humor style gameplay, you know, of, of like uh, getting hit in the face with a pie or, you know, stepping on something. Those games really took a massive hit because of how they're purchased. They were purchased mm -hmm. because kids would see them and then when your parents would walk through a store they would you would go hey i saw that game that looks super fun i played it at so and so's house and the parent because those games are really inexpensive you know less than twenty dollars a uh, parent might pick it up that was a real big driver in the in the mass market uh environment not so much on like amazon or on the internet or at a specialty small specialty store um, those games really, really dropped through the floor because during this period of time, parents are not going to, if they're going to spend their money and some of them not having all the money that they had before to try to get something that's going to quote entertain their child, they're going to go with something they know. So what ended up happening is games like Labyrinth or uh, Clue or Monopoly, uh, Connect Four went through the roof, things like that. Um, 
became a, a, a default, if you will, for parents because they knew the game. They didn't have to learn it. They're all crammed in the same house together. So there was not a lot of time. Also, we saw in the very first, second quarter of the year, so basically the first uh, quarter trimester of this of, of isolation, educational games going way up. Parents are like, hey, if I'm going to spend it and I'm going to also have to do some level of teaching or education uh, on my end, I want something that's going to be uh, useful in that regard. So we have a division called Think Fun, um, which does educational STEM games. And they had a, they, they saw a big increase in their ability to, to uh, do that. So there's a lot of games that um, much like the Gravitrax and the things that we do with the Pacific Science Center that are, that are activities, but have an educational aspect, games that had or could be defined with an educational aspect also took off during that period of time. They were commenting about parents loving games where they know how to play. Carmela commented about some of the challenges in learning a really dense game and have it so much easier when somebody has explained it to her. Um, There's the, yeah, that's usually me because I'm pretty sure that's my sister. Um, <laughs> so um, can, can you talk a little bit about the thought that goes into like making just, you know, those quick instruction sheets to help people learn how to play a game? Yeah, it really comes down to for our standpoint of that audience and if, what we know about games and this and what we know really about life. So it's not really a game thing, but we use it all the We talk about it all the time in games. And that is what we call playing up. So, and we know it. We know that the youngest child wants to do what the older child is doing. So if we make a six plus or an eight plus game, let's say uh, Marvel Villainous, which is like 10 plus. So if we take a 10 plus game, we know that we can't do a Disney game that's not gonna, that's not gonna have a six or eight year old hanging on the game, game trying to figure out um, and so we know that when we make a game, we try to make the rules go down. Sometimes that's, it's not, we don't succeed. <laughs> Sometimes we make the rules for exactly the group we're making them. But what ends up happening and what we try to do is the crazy thing about what this um, pandemic has done is we now do things like uh, live video gameplay tutorials. Uh, we now do things like live video gameplay tutorials on our website that we'll be posting. And giving people a visual sometimes is way better. You know, one of the bad parts about game rules is we teach it in the kind of only one way, which is read these, sit down, read these rules, understand them, digest. Yeah, so play a game. And some people of, don't learn that way. Some people learn, as we know, you know, visually. Some people learn some mm -hmm. people are doing, going all the way back if you want technology. So I know that uh, I don't know if I got that, but you know, again, it's it's all about, you know, we you know we try to make it as simple as possible for the age group we're shooting for, but we also know that sometimes rules are actually intriguing and um, interesting and interaction. And, and as we said really at the beginning, games are, are part of a game is the interacting with other players. And if those rules don't allow for that because we cut them for ease of learning, sometimes we end up in a bad place. We don't make a very quality end product, so. So what are some of the favorite games you love to play? Um, and uh, asking, <laughs> do people who work in games hate to play games outside of work or do you love it? Uh, I play a lot of games. <laughs> I own a lot of games. I play a lot of games. Um, I, I will state up and down uh, until uh, the bitter end that I think one of the more clever, creative, interestingly long-term games that, I've, that I play that I still use as a model is the game Clue. It, mm -hmm. I, I know it sounds simple and, and silly to people, but it's, it's the really the only mystery game in which you can play it and then turn around and replay it, not in having no in, in basically starting at scratch you don't have there's no institutional memory and because of that in the simplicity of pu them pulling that off back then uh clue is is one of my all-time favorite games um from board game standpoint uh i love uh the game lords of Waterdeep. 
um, which is a game from Wizards of the Coast. It uses a, a, a worker placement mechanic for those who uh, are interested in that terminology. Um, there's a game from, um, um, there's a really old history game that I love called um, uh, Kingmaker, which is about the War of the Roses. I, uh, my brothers and I played that until we couldn't stand each other anymore. Um, the, uh, there's a game called um, Talisman, which I actually played on my, uh, the night before my wedding with all my best men. Uh, that's, uh, that's always a favorite game of ours, uh, my family and mine. Um, and then from Ravensburger, I actually really like Castles of Burgundy because it does something really unique in how it makes you make player choices and that, that, that player choice uh, loop, as well as a game that we did for kids called Based on the Incredible Movie. Um, uh, that's, oh my gosh, I totally blanked on the name. I love that game. It's just so fun. It's like right on. It hits all the right notes. Uh, Save the Day is what it's called. So those are my games right now. Although Horrified is actually really good. And I'm working on that. I've been working on that game. So that one's really good. So yeah, some people were commenting on it in the chat for sure. Um, so it's aside from playing a lot of games, Luke's curious, what, how, how would you encourage a young person to what should they study if they want to be a professional game designer? Well, the world's different than when I went to school. <laughs> I, there was nothing, no one ever thought anybody went into games as a career or any kind of lifetime thing. So as I said earlier, I have a degree in theater and I have a degree in uh, philosophy um, and a bunch of minor degrees. And I went to grad school for English literature, which I also have a degree. Um, but that all said, there are schools now that kind of have, there's schools now that have programs that have, that teach you games. As I said, I taught games at UW Bothell for a while. Um, there's some really good teachers and schools and programs out there that have that. But, and I will state this from the very big, very early, and maybe if Luke's a high schooler, he may not want to hear that. Um, as you saw, everything was part of our dis discussion. Um, there was art and design and design element. There was writing with storytelling and crafting a uh, co cohesive storyline. The mechanics are almost always math-based and an underlying uh, mathematical thing in order to get that fair and balanced uh, thing. And then the writing is making them comprehensible. So it's a it's a multi thing. And then if you went into production or any of that, um, there's engineering, there's um, uh, there's uh, you know uh, international trade laws <laughs> that you need to know. Um, there's all kinds of stuff. So. I, there's no one path. Um, I got really, really great advice from someone once, um, the old film critic, Roger Ebert, and I corresponded for a while when I was in high school, and I asked him how to get into movies. And he said, no, that's not what you did. You're asking the wrong question. Um, you should be asking, what can you do for movies? And so that's a really different take. And that's a way of kind of looked at it saying, Okay, it's not what does the game, how do I break into that is what talent can I bring to an already existing infrastructure and that's games and whether it's electronic games, if you're going thinking electronics, then obviously you need to study programming. Um, uh, I always tell people that if they really want to know how difficult it is to make a game take their ultimate favorite game. Now deconstruct it and make it better, because that's what we have to do every day in our job, my job is to say, is this game good enough. And you have to take what you love and pull it down to its little tiny parts and go, well, maybe I can change this piece. I don't want to because the game's working, but I need to be make it better. So if you can do that and look at a game and start kind of tearing them apart, whether they're, you know, coded or board games and look at the mechanics underneath the hood, that goes really far to being able to convince someone later on that you have the skills needed to, to do work in the game industry. Yeah, it sounds like there's an element of creativity and being really curious and asking a lot of questions. And I'm so excited that you answered as you did because it connects really closely to a question from Michelle asking, how do you keep yourself going when you get discouraged making a game? <laughs> you're like picking it apart and you're just like, will this work? Uh, yes, it's, it's a, um, it is actually seriously emotional. <laughs> um, it is, it, the, the cool thing is it's a very, um, 
aha moment type of thing where just when you think you can't figure it out, it doesn't work. Sometimes you just set it aside. I find my big aha moments come uh, directly when I am really frustrated. I don't know what to do. I am what I would consider a social designer, meaning that I will just go and right now, unfortunately, it's my family who just looks at me with, you know, please don't bring me into your crazy conversations, um, where I will just go and just start talking and just say, okay, here's where I'm at, blah, 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 blah. Sometimes before I've even fit, said the words out loud and finished, I'll have a solution. They don't have to answer anything. It works better if I'm working and talking to other designers or other, other parts of the project. And to that end, we ended up starting um, uh, daily or weekly meetings on every project because we're not together anymore. And while e email is only so good, just talking stuff out to people and just hearing how they would address it, that really makes it worth it. And it makes it worth it when a game like Marvel Villainous comes out and people like it and they're buying it and they're engaged. They're engaged enough to send questions and comments and, and talk about things and horrified as well uh, that came out last year. So all of that, the, there's an end reward, but man, sometimes like every creative scientific, basically I have to always say these words. I make games for a living, so it's actually really, really cool and I'm super happy and it's awesome, but it's still considered work. <laughs> it's still a job. <laughs> yeah. So there are days that I go, I never, <laughs> why am I here? And there are days where I go, uh, uh, I can't make another game, I'm done. Um, but that's the part that we all suffer when we all go to our jobs and some of us really love our jobs and love what we do, but it's, it's real. And it's, it's for me, the struggle is, is finding the words to tell somebody that I'm having, that I don't know what I'm, where I'm at right now or what's lost. I'm better at it. I've been doing it a long time. So it doesn't, the highs and lows are not as high and low or the lows are not as low as they used to be. And the highs are really cool because I'm already kind of, uh, I love that. Uh, but the, the lows aren't as bad as they used to be. <laughs> yeah. Because I, 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 kind of encountered all of them. Everything from games being canceled, literally after working on them for, you know, months, and then all of a sudden finding that the game has been canceled, or uh, something is so radically altered in the environment that it, you know, the game will never come out or something like that. Yeah, um, yeah some serious work for uh, ultimately something that's fun. Yeah, um, exactly. Mike, I think we only have time for one more question. And sure. It's a really, really timely question. And I, I do want to acknowledge there's actually several more questions we just haven't had, don't have the time to get to. So thank you everybody for having such an amazing chat thread going and for putting in so many questions, answering each other's questions and putting in game recommendations. Um, that's been wonderful to see so many great that games. That sounds really cool. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back and look those up. Yeah, for sure. We'll definitely save this and, and I'll mention that in a moment. Um, but we're still in these this time of COVID and some physical distancing. So are there some great games um, from Robinsberger that are able to be played remotely? Or do you know of other games that aren't video games that you can play in this time of um, physical distancing? So we struggle with this all the time. One, uh, just real quick aside, we can't normal do our normal testing of games. You know, again, we play games to sit them at, you know, we make board games. We need people around the table playing and we struggle with that. Um, there is an electronic um, a game system called Tabletop Simulator. Um, and Tabletop Simulator is available through Steam. For those who are familiar with Steam uh, here out of Seattle, it's uh, basically a game uh, shell and uh, a, a game hosting site. And the Tabletop Simulator sells games, so you can buy like a really good version of things like uh, Wingspan or some of the other games. And a lot of players make their own home versions of that. They can't sell them. They can go and like put like Uno in, for instance, and you can play virtual Uno with a bunch of other people live. Um, there's a handful of tabletop simulators, the one I have on my desktop. So that's the reason why I can say that one. But there's a bunch of different um, basically hubs that allow people to play games together. Um, we've had really good success with our villainous game of people playing it remotely because you play on your own board. We actually did an entire video of how you would adapt that game to uh, playing. And we're trying to figure out how to do it with some of the, our other games. 
but we didn't foresee this either. <laughs> right. As much as I make it sound like we knew everything, we actually didn't know this. And so a lot of our games, obviously, you know, something like Horrified for the people who've played it, that's almost impossible without, uh, you know, a whole rig set up in your home. But using tabletop simulators, a straight up screen screen thing, um, there are there are communities uh, that have been trying to to figure out ways to play various games online. So I would, you know, do any kind of search for that. Like I said, mm -hmm. we've we figured out a way to do it for Villainous. So we we've been promoting that one, but uh, it is very hard. And we are, um, I think our German team, and I don't know if they're all in English, has been doing it because they have a much deeper catalog of of like kids games and, and things like that, that they've been trying to figure out a way to do than we do. Uh, sorry, it's, we're in that same boat. We're trying to yeah. figure out how to do it ourselves. And uh, we didn't plan to have a lot of games to be able to do that. So we're still working on that part. Well, Villainous sounds like a good one. So that might have to be the next one that I try. And you said that you have, a um, is it on the Ravensburger YouTube site? Some instructions of how to- Oh, uh, I think so. I'm sorry. I don't have any of that, the links. It, it's actually, um, I know if you go to, uh, oh, it, just to plug a, a, a site that carries a lot of these things. Um, there's a site called Board Game Geek, Board Game Geek or BGG. Um, a lot of communities on there that are looking to try to figure out this solution. Some people will say, I will even host your game or, or here's how we've been trying to figure it out. So there's a lot of good pointers there. Um, that's, they, they were the company who did our, um, the, the, they did our villainous uh, video. So it's, it's in their system someplace as well as okay. uh, probably linked to our stuff. That, that sounds great. And we have everybody, everybody who's watching, if you, it, if you have an idea um, or if you have some links to some great games that can be played during these slightly more remote times, please go ahead and put them in the chat for everybody else as well. Um, and we have, we have an awesome social media team that looks and, and tries to post those things. So if you follow us on Instagram or Twitter or even uh, Facebook, you'll see links that we will occasionally repost. And in fact, over the weekend, I, I told this to, um, uh, uh, we the, would normally have been the biggest game convention in North America. It's called Gen Con for those who are not familiar. And all weekend we did nothing but pose the, then do walkthroughs of our games. So we did about 10 or 12 of our games. So for those who are asking about rules and how do I play this or how do I understand that or what's this game all about, you can watch an entire playthrough of a game. It's they last about 40 minutes. If the comments are still there, there's my comments in there about some hints and tricks uh, that you might want to know about the game itself. And it, including, a, um, so you, you can search those. I think they're on our Twitter account right now and they're going to go to Facebook and some of the other spots as well. So yeah. anybody who wants to just learn more about our games that we sh should be covering it everywhere. So <laughs> that sounds great. Um, and I don't know about everybody else who's watching, but my games to playlist has grown exponentially as a result of tonight's talk. Um, so, so thank you all for the comments. And thank you, Mike, so much for joining us today with your time and your expertise. Um, a, amazing opportunity to peel back some of the layers and learn more about game design. We hope thank you. Like, like I said, I wish that we could go into each one of those subjects in super deep dive, but we don't have the time. <laughs> <laughs> but we'd be Maybe here till Friday, time. it sounds like. <laughs> Maybe next time. Maybe. Uh, if you have a suggestion for next time, um, we do have a short survey. The link is in the chat box, um, and we'll email it to you as well. We would love to hear your thoughts about tonight's presentation, um, including other things that you're interested in learning um, that we can feature in upcoming Science in the City. Um, also, if you've enjoyed this tonight, or if you just need to look at the chat thread again to get the list of games to play, this video will be saved on PacSize YouTube page. The link will be there and can be shared out with family and friends or watched again. Thank you so much for joining. Please sign up for our e-newsletter at PacSize.org, and please consider donating at PacSize.org slash support. Um, by signing up for our e-newsletter, you can hear about upcoming Science in the City talks, including in two weeks where we'll be talking with uh, the NHL, and then check out our calendar page where there's a lot more activities that are happening each week, all virtually, great opportunities to learn um, and increase your own curiosity. Thank you so much for joining us tonight and have a great night, everybody. Mike, thank you again. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.